G'day guys, Dean from Blog for the Blood God here. It's been a very busy month for me with Warhammer 40k events. We had the Radicalism ITC Championships where I placed second overall and played an undefeated record. Second up was the Maitland Team Championships, which again, I went undefeated and my team placed first overall. That was teams of five. And then we finished it off with Australia's most prestigious 40k event, the Australian Team Championships, where every state in Australia puts together a team of their eight best players, and we go head to head to see which state is the best. At that, I dropped one game, but won my other four. So of my last 15 tournament games, I've only suffered a single loss. So I wanted to share with you the list that I ran at these events, some of the strategies and, and tricks that I did in, in my games, so that hopefully you could take some of that, you know, pick apart the parts you like, pick apart the bits you thought were interesting, and maybe have some similar success of your own. So without further ado, let's get into the list. Alright, let me start by running you through the list. So it's a pure Emperor's Children Chaos Space Marines list. Uh, you'll have to forgive me, it's not the prettiest. Uh, with back-to-back -back tournaments, I really didn't have time to sort of make every model the prettiest, so a lot of them are sort of thrown together from a bits box and then some basic paint slapped on them just to get them tournament ready. Um, but yeah, so Emperor's Children, CSM, Battalion. It's led by our Warlord here, which is the, uh, the Master of Executions. Now, I believe that this cunt has a legitimate claim to being the most powerful, for his points, unit in the entire game. He's a 65 point character. He has a Warlord trait called Flames of Spite, which basically means on a 6 plus to wound, he does an additional mortal wound. And then his Axe of Dismemberment also does, on a 6 plus to wound, a mortal wound. So basically every time he rolls a 6 to wound, he does two mortal wounds on top of the normal damage. And then with Veterans of the Long War, you can make that five plus because it's on a six plus so if you add one to your wound rolls you're now doing it on a five so basically he goes in and on a five up to wound he does two mortal wounds in addition to his normal damage then his relic is the raiment revulsive which basically gives him reroll hits wounds and charges so basically you can put prescience on him so he gets plus one to hit and he goes in and he hits on twos and any five plus to hit gives you an additional hit and then basically you can re-roll everything that's not a 5 and fish, I call it fishing, so you fish for 5s then you're going to end out of those 6 attacks you're probably going to hit 8 times then you're going to roll those 8 wound rolls and any 5 pluses do 2 mortal wounds and again you can re-roll everything so anything that's not a 5 plus you can if you want to re-roll them and fish for those 5s and he just puts out a shit ton of mortal wounds uh, there's a few other strats that you can use on him that are really good, such as every time a model dies, he gets to make an additional attack. So that's really good if you go into a big unit of something where you go, cool, I'm going to go in with my six attacks, I'm going to get eight hits, I'm going to kill like four or five models, and now I get to make an additional four or five attacks, which again explode and do all the same stuff. So basically this one guy is a single model that's 65 points and a couple rel a relic and a warlord trait and he just fucking kills everything for example in one game he killed 17 scarab occult terminators in a single fight phase so this guy is an absolute murder machine and i i'm shocked that he's not all over the internet and i'm shocked that gw haven't tried to fucking ban him because he's so fucking good anyway he's my warlord uh, my second HQ choice I've given the Chaos Sorcerer. He's there for prescience and warp time. And for one CP, I can swap out his one of his psychic powers, which is normally Smite, for Delightful Agonies. And that allows me to put a 5-up Feel No Pain on a Terminator unit. Prescience obviously allows me to put that crucial plus one to hit on a, a friendly unit. And then warp time allows me to double move units, which is also very, very powerful. And in my third HQ slot, I have this guy down here. He's the Dark Apostle and he has his two disciples with him. And he has a relic, which I spent a CP to get, which is the uh, Remnant of Marjabalia, which is the Emperor's Children relic, which basically gives a once per game, instead of citing a prayer, he can activate his Remnant, and it gives him a six inch aura of reroll all wound rolls. So that's very, very powerful on the Noise Marines. Now we go into our troops choices. We've got a unit of 20 Noise Marines up the front here. There's 20 of them. They all have Sonic Blasters, with the exception of the two guys up the front that have Blast Masters. 
we have a lightning floor on the sergeant and we also have an icon of excess. Now this unit is like 440 points, it's ridiculously expensive, however, it is an absolute game winning unit. So I spend 2 CP pre-game, it's on my list, for uh, plus 2 to their movement characteristic, which is a combat elixir's stratagem from the Emperor's Children supplement. So basically what that does is that means they now get an 8 inch move, they can advance and shoot with their guns because they're assault, and you can warp time them for a double move. That means they can be moving 16 inches up the table plus D6 for the advance, so up to, what, 22 inches, and then shooting with a billion guns. Really, really powerful, and it often catches people off guard. And also what it allows them to do is, if you don't need to do the advance, you can actually move your 16 inches up the table and then charge turn one. And with Honor the Prince, which is an Emperor's Children stratagem that allows you to roll your charge dice, and then after you see the result, change one of the dice to a six you're often making 10 or 11 inch charges. So these guys being able to go 16 inches up the table and then have a reliable 10 inch charge means that if your opponent is not backlined, you're likely to hit them turn one. So very, very powerful unit. Some of the things worth noting with the uh, noise marines is there's a few stratagems that I use on them regularly. There's a uh, stratagem for plus one strength and damage on their sonic weapons, which is all the sonic blasters and the blast masters. That's obviously very powerful, brings them to an average of strength 5 with 2 damage. These guys can kill knights from, from full health to dead. They're very, very powerful. And then obviously they put out 3 shots each, so they're also just as effective at killing Horde. Very, very powerful unit. You can pair that with Veterans of the Long War for plus 1 to wound, so now they're strength 5 with plus 1 to wound, which means they're wounding things like knights on 4s. And then obviously the once per game reroll all wounds, um, relic from the Apostle means that they're winning knights on fours with rerolls, winning marines on twos with rerolls. They're very, very strong. Um, and then obviously there's the Endless Cacophony strat that's been around since forever. 2 CP, double shoot. So the amount of damage these guys put out is just fucking insane. It's absolutely, like, even through two up armor, because there's no armor piercing on the guns, except for the Blastmasters, but the, you know, most of their guns are AP zero. So you'd think, oh, two-up armor saves are going to be a problem, but not really, because if you're putting out 120 shots that are hitting on twos, wounding on twos with re-rolls, like, even just custodial units just evaporate to that, because eventually they're going to start rolling ones, and then you're doing two damage with every one that they roll. It's really, really strong. Uh, so that's my first troop to choice. Then we've got a unit of ten cultists here, and a unit of five CSM on the front. Now, basically, they're there for doing things like banners, uh, holding backfields, screening out, that sort of stuff, the pleb stuff. Um, the reason that I went with cultists and CSM is merely because of points. If I could afford the points, I probably would have done two units of CSM. Uh, however, the cultists were very good because it's unit 10, they're able to string out and create a bigger footprint, which is better for backfield screening and those sorts of things. Whereas the armor of contempt on those marines is very good as well. So often when I was doing my screening, I'd basically the cultists would be at the very, very back of the army and they'd be creating that big bubble out the back. And then the CSM would be the ones that'd be pushing up and screening out a flank. Uh, then we've got a rhino, trusty old faithful rhino, which has eight chosen with it, right? Now the eight chosen, they've all, all of them have got lightning claws and four of them have chainsaws. The sergeant has twin lightning claws. And basically, this unit goes in the Rhino with the Master of Executions and the Sorcerer. And what that does is that allows me to keep all of those, those things safe, out of line of sight, and with the changes to Barrage, not many things are killing a Rhino that's out of line of sight. So it sits out of line of sight, and then basically the uh, Sorcerer can then disembark to wherever the Noise Marines are so that he can put the buffs on them, put the warp time on them, that sort of stuff. Uh, so it deploys kind of centrally. Um, and then that Rhino basically sits there ready to counter punch. So if somebody comes in and they blow up the Noise Marines and they kill all that stuff, they're basically going to put themselves in a position where next turn the Chosen are going to be able to disembark out and kill them, or the Master of Executions is going to be able to do it, or both, depending on the situation. Uh, but basically they position themselves and stage for a counter charge, and they also disincentivize your opponent from going in on those central objectives, because they know if they come in, they're going to get hit by this stuff. Um, so basically, the characters and the Chosen go in there. And the other thing that's really good about that is Emperor's Children have a 1 CP strat to redeploy a unit. And if you put the, all of them in the Rhino, you can then redeploy the Rhino for 1 CP. And it's kind of like redeploying all three units 
for one CP. Um, so basically, generally what I'll do is I'll put the, the noise marines on one flank of the table, the rhino on the other, and then depending on which direction I want to go, I'll either spend a CP to redeploy the rhino over here with the noise marines and I'll go in that way, or I'll spend a CP to redeploy the noise marines over with the rhino and I'll go in that way. So that way basically it's one CP and no matter where you want to go, your entire army can go there. Very, very powerful strategy. Um, and then we've got, obviously, the Armour of Contempt making these things just too good to turn down. So I've got three units of ten Chaos Space Marine Terminators, all of them with Lightning Claws. Two of them have Melter Guns on everyone. So unit of ten with Combi Melter Lightning Claw, unit of ten Combi Melter Lightning Claw, and then a unit of ten with Combi Bolter Lightning Claw. Um, and yeah, that's the list. So basically, the, the strategy of the list, really, really effective, and it worked this, pretty much exactly the same in every single game, is I would take uh, Raise the Banners High was one secondary, The Long Wall was one secondary, and Stranglehold was another secondary. Uh, and the one that I would change out is if they had something like Assassinate they were vulnerable to, or Bring It Down, or something like that, I would swap Banners out, because it was often the one that I scored the lowest in. But basically, I'd operate off of that base template, is those are the three that I take. And then basically you'd put all three Terminator units in, in Deep Strike Reserves, you'd put the chosen the characters in the Rhino, so you'd deploy a Rhino, a unit of Noise Marines, and then the Cultists and the, the Marines. And basically the Cultists and the Marines would deploy your banner on your home field, then your um, Noise Marines would move out into the middle two objectives and that'd get you Stranglehold for your three, and then they would shoot stuff. Then from turns two onwards, you're dropping Terminators in, you're double shooting with the Melty Guns and blowing a bunch of stuff up, then you honour the Prince, you charge onto one of their objectives and take it from them, and that gets you your Long War and supports your Stranglehold. And you just do that over and over, you just keep sending Terminators in, blowing them up off of their objectives, taking it, getting scoring the Long War, and then continuing to hold your Stranglehold. And then in turn two, the Chosen, uh, sorry, the CSM and the Cultists, after raising the banner on your home field, they move up and raise it on the next two. And you basically, you keep moving forward like that, um, defending those three objectives and taking all of theirs. The Noise Marines are an exceptionally powerful unit when it comes to Stranglehold because you can basically put them up in the middle of the table so they get the Stranglehold turn one because they have that eight inch move and they warp timing often. They're able to get onto those objectives early and then they shoot and do a whole bunch of damage. And then the thing with the Noise Marines is when they die, they shoot on death. So your opponent is often very hesitant to engage with the Noise Marines because if they move out and shoot you, they're giving you a free shooting phase back into them in their own turn. And when that happens, they'll often screen you. So they'll, they'll send out small units to block your Terminators. So when your Terminators drop, they have to hit small units instead of their big juicy targets. However, what you do with the Noise Marines is you move them out, and now if they shoot your Noise Marines in their turn, in their turn you shoot their small screening units with the Noise Marines, which means there's no screens left, which means the Terminators are free to go in and do their maximum damage. So, the Noise Marines were an absolutely critical part of this list. They pair so well with the Terminators because they just clear screening units like it's nobody's business. And also, if there is some big juicy target, the Noise Marines are very capable of just going in and blowing it up. So that was the sort of general strategy of the list and it worked out of the 15 games, it worked 14 times. So I think that's a pretty pretty damn good success rate. Um, so some of the problems that I had with the list and some of the potential changes that I'm looking at making in the future is there's the cultists and the CSM aren't able to raise banners in the middle of the board, turn one, because they only have a six inch move, and most of the time, those central objectives are further than six inches from your deployment. So I'm actually looking at potentially swapping them out to some extent for uh, Raptors. So I'll probably have to keep the two units as five CSM, because you need to have three for your battalion. Uh, however, being able to get some Raptors in there is gonna be really powerful. One of the other challenges was having three units of Terminators, while they were very, very good, the problem is, is you have to drop them in turns two and three. So you have to drop one of them turn two and then two of them turn three, or vice versa, two of them on turn two and one on turn three. And the challenge there is uh, a lot of their damage comes from when they drop, they double shoot, but only one unit can do that. 
when they charge, they want to use Honor the Prince to make it so it's a guarantee, effectively a guaranteed charge from Deep Strike. Only one of them can do that. So having three units was a little bit clunky. Uh, I don't regret it. It was definitely useful because you were able to drop a unit in cover and because of Armoury Contempt, they're just really durable. And that allows you to drop in cover and then next turn, on turn four, move out and do damage with that unit. So it wasn't the worst, but it, um, it could have been done better. So what I'm looking at doing is, is dropping one unit of ten and then putting in a Dread Claw with another unit of Chosen. And that way that can come down turn one so you go turn one, Dread Claw Chosen, turn two, Terminators, turn three, more Terminators. Um, so you're sacrificing some durability by turning Terminators into Chosen. They, know they have less wounds, they have less uh, armor saves, so they're not as tough. However, being able to go in turn one is a massive power boost. And it also allows you to score that long war on your first turn, and also just apply huge amounts of pressure to your opponent in that first turn. So. That's one thing that I'm looking to change, is swapping Terminators out for more Chosen, using some of the points left over from that to put in some Raptors, um, potentially dropping the Rhino, because um, even though redeploying like that was very powerful, if I'm dropping the Rhino for a Dreadclaw for the Chosen, now I don't really need the redeploy, because I'm just deep striking. So it just means that the characters will be a little bit more difficult to wield, but it's something that I'm toying with the idea of running. So. I'll definitely keep you guys up to date with how that goes. Um, but yeah, some of the other really interesting things with the list that I, I sort of learnt throughout the process of, of running these games, because basically I submitted the lists for Maitland Team Challenge and the ATC at the same time. So I'd locked myself into running an identical list for those two. At Radicalism, the list was slightly different, but the, the general sort of theme was the same. Um, but yeah, at those two events, since I'd locked myself in, I was actually playing the same list for those 10 games, which allowed me to sort of learn and, and figure out different tricks. So one of the challenges, like I said, was that your CSM and your uh, cultists aren't fast enough to raise banners turn one. What I realized partway through one of the events is I could, instead of putting the Chosen in Rhino, I could deploy the Rhino on the front line with the CSM in it, Chosen behind it, and then turn one, disembark the CSN out 9 inches and then embark the Chosen in. And that way I end up with the same situation because then the Rhino can move off with the Chosen inside. So you end up with the same situation where you've got Chosen inside a Rhino with your characters but you've just granted your CSN squad an extra 3 inches of movement which allows it to get up the field, raise a banner. So they raise a banner upfield, the cultists raise a banner downfield and the thing about the cultists is they can go, okay, we're on the backfield objective, but we can string out, and then in their movement phase, they can string out a bit further, raise a banner back here, and then in the next turn, move across and raise a banner over there. So it was able to do banners quite effectively. Um, but yeah, so that's, that's something I'm looking at potentially changing. A uh, piece of advice for people who want to run a list similar to this, if you want to play with it, just before the new CSM codex comes out and invalidates everything I just said, um, a few pieces of advice is that you'll probably get tabled every game. Almost every game, I was left with nothing on the table. Even the games where I was just absolutely pole-axing my opponent, I still ended with nothing. Because you drop a unit of Terminators down, they double shoot and blow up a bunch of shit, then they go in and charge, they kill something, take that objective. But then in your opponent's turn, they just put their whole army on that Terminator unit and kill it. And then next turn, you drop down more Terminators, do the same, and they just kill you. And then at the end, you're like, I have nothing, but I scored massive amounts of victory points in the first three turns. Like, you're getting Stranglehold, you're getting Long War, and you're getting Banners every turn. And you're, getting, you're dominating them on primary because you're just going in and blowing them off of their objectives. So you're dominating them on primary for the first three turns. You're dominating them on the secondaries. And then basically the you'll feel the tide turn where you've got nothing left. And they're just rolling you up. That's where the Rhino with the Chosen and the Master of Executions come in handy. Because basically they've rolled you up. They've killed all your Terminators. They've killed all your Noise Marines. That you've got like your CSM are dead. Your Cultists are dead. But then this little rhino can just, you know, Chosen can jump out this way, the Master of Execution jumps out this way, and you just blow a whole bunch more shit up, and they're just like, wow, there's fucking, that rhino is just busted. Like, the amount of damage that its contents can do is huge. Um, and people generally ignore it. So, 
that's uh, that's something worth noting. But it is it is worth noting that you will you will get tabled, and that's okay. That's part of the plan. This list is designed to go in and have a really strong first three turns. Let your opponent have a strong turn four and five. You have a strong turns one, two, and three, and that just wins. You just win games that way. So it doesn't matter if they get a twelve point primary on turn five because you got a twelve point primary on turn two, you know, and three, and probably one. You know, like if you go if you go in it well not on one obviously, but you know what I mean. Like if you go in and have a really strong turns one, two, and three, and just really punish them and really just destroy as much of their army as you can and score as many of your victory points as you can on those first three turns, then it's pretty much smooth sailing from there. Uh, some of the challenging lists, so uh, I played Tau twice, and both of those I thought I was going to lose, but um, managed to pull wins out of them. So Crisis Suit units with all of the Iridium suits and all of the shield drones and all of that shit with their neg two to your charge strat, where they can basically the photon grenades or whatever it's called, where they make you neg two, that's really, really hard to crack because the terminators drop down, they double shoot the melter guns, but the tower blade just takes it all on drones, shield drones, and you, it just does nothing. And then you go, cool, well, I'm gonna charge you. And then they go, cool, you neg two to your charges. So now you actually need to roll an 11, which with Honor the Prince isn't that hard because basically you roll two dice, as long as one of them is a five, you turn the other one into a six and then you go. And if neither of them are a five, you spend a CP to re-roll both. And then if one of those is a five, you turn the other to a six. So you essentially have four attempts at rolling a five plus, but it does fail and it really does hurt when that happens because you know now you're sitting ducks for the tower to shoot you. And the other problem is even when you do get in, you know, if you, if you don't have your Sorcerer, if he's been taken out and you don't have Prescience, you're not killing that Crisis Suit unit, even after you make it into combat. Because the Iridium Suit pushes your Lightning Claws to giving them a 4-up save, and if they've put the 5-up Feel No Pain on them, the Sense of Stone or whatever it is, uh, your Terminator unit's going to hit and it's going to bounce. And you're going to be like, wow, I just threw everything I had, Kitchen Sink, at this Crisis Suit unit, and it didn't die. And that hurts. The, uh, the key to the tower matchup is wielding the noise marines well, because those noise marines almost kill an entire crisis suit unit. Um, but if, if, if your opponent lets you double shoot them, then you will. You'll just kill a crisis suit unit from full health to nothing, even through the two ups of the iridium. So it's, it's worth noting that the, the noise marines are your savior in the tower matchup. So the key there is keeping them safe. So you need to find a nice ruin where you can hide your noise marines put your Rhino and your CSM and your Chosen out and your Cultists out to sort of create screens so that if they do Deep Strike on you turn one using the um, Stealth Suits and the Teleport Homer, just make it so they can't get an angle on your Noise Marines. That's all that matters. Because then if they do that and they go, cool, dropped in, boom, blew up your Rhino, blew up your Cultists, blew up all of this sort of stuff, you're like, okay, cool, that sucks, you just killed a bunch of my stuff. But then the Noise Marines are going to be able to come out and they're going to be able to kill that unit of Suits that dropped. And then... Hopefully they only have two of those suit units, and then you can sort of just try to play around the other one. Um, maybe try to double team it with two units of Terminators dropping at the same time and going, cool, that's 30 Melter Gun shots because 10, 10, and then a double shoot for another 10. 30 Melter Gun shots is pretty spicy, and if you shoot the, um, you know, the Noise Marines in first, they're going to start taking them on the Iridium, which means that then when the Melter Guns hit, they have to finish taking them on the Iridium, and they can't put them on the Shield Drones, so... That can help, but the tower matchup is definitely a challenging one. Unfortunately, I didn't get to play any Eldar except for a Drakari list. So I played Drakari on one of them, but none of the new Craft World Eldar. I also played a Harlequins list. Harlequins is not a, is not a problem for this list at all, because the Noise Marines are just so efficient into killing them. Um, because you get just so many shots, it doesn't matter if they're light and you can only hit them on fours. You're like, that's cool, I've got 120 shots, I'm going to hit you a oh, like. 60 times, you know, um, and then when you're doing two damage and no AP, but it doesn't matter because they've just got invulnerable saves anyway. The noise marines are so efficient to the Harleys, you just put them in the middle of the table and they'll just win the game for you. Um, and then the terminators, obviously, they drop down and they do a lot of good work there as well. So Harlequins is not a big problem. Same with the Drakari. The Drakari on a really dense table can be a challenge because they can make it hard for you to get those shots into them, but your offensive profile just is really good into their defense. So 
the noise rings do massive amounts of work there as well. And also, a lot of the Jakari stuff isn't that good at killing Terminators. So, you, because you're Armour of Contempt, you can get good two-up saves against most of their stuff. It's not that big of a deal. But I didn't play any Craft World Elder. Um, and I feel like the Craft World Elder are probably a problem for this list. The other thing that I didn't get an opportunity to play against was Tyranids. However, we mapped it out, and the Noise Marines do actually kill a shit ton of Tyranids, as do the Terminators. And one of the things that the Tyranids are, are renowned for is the amount of damage that they put out. But the thing is, is if I deploy the Noise Marines back, they're not hitting the Noise Marines until the Noise Marines hit them. And the Terminators, they're all in Deep Strike. So the Tyranid player is not hitting the Terminators until the Terminators drop down and hit them. So you sort of always get the first say. And I feel like that is going to be very critical in the Tyranid matchup. So I'm not too worried about Tyranids. I'm not too worried about the Eldars. The Tau are a concern. However, I did manage to beat two Tau players. So maybe I'm just being a little um, conservative with my estimations on that game. But yeah, the Tau could potentially pose a problem. What are some of the other big dogs? Things like Custodes is not a problem anymore. Tanglefoot Grenade is annoying and it can make the Terminator's lives very difficult. However, the Noise Marines go in and they just kill a ton of them. Uh, Thousand Suns are actually a pretty interesting problem for the uh, for this list because they have the strat on their Terminators to make them neg one damage, um, which basically makes these Noise Marines just single damage hitting into two up saves. Like, that's not very good. Um, and then they also get to all spec scan, so they get to shoot you. I can't remember what their strat's called, but basically when you deep strike neat within 12 of them, they can shoot you. Which means if the Terminators want to drop in, the Terminators are going to struggle to do their damage because if they drop in within 12 so that they can shoot their melty guns and so that they can declare their charges, the Thousand Suns get to shoot you before you charge, before you shoot. So that's a bit of a problem. Thousand Suns are actually an interesting challenge for this list. However, this Master of Executions, like I said, he went in in one game and killed 17 Scarabacol in a single fight. Uh, which, granted, I was rolling like an absolute fucking demon, um, but it's still possible, um, and he can single-handedly swing that matchup. Depending, if they're running three units of Scarabacot, it's probably not that big of a deal, because he goes in and kills one or two of them, and then the rest of your army easily kills the third. So, it's not that big of a deal, but I could see that being a challenging matchup. Um, I uh, played Admech, absolutely smashed them just because the Noise Marines are so effective into them. I was able to kill like 60, pretty much 60 of their Vanguard veterans on the first turn. Just went in and went, cool, double shoot, double shoot, you know, blah, blah, blah. Shooting on death, killing the fucking, those little sulfur hounds that they send out. And then the Terminators go in and mop up. Like that was a very, very commanding win. I think I got a 20, 20 zero, which is the maximum possible win you could get in this format. Um, so yeah, overall, very strong list. I'm very happy with it, and I'm actually not looking forward to the upcoming CSM Codex because I feel like we've just got to sort of hit the ground running with Armor of Contempt on this, really dialing that up to the next level, and it actually makes this list really powerful. So yeah, this is uh, the Emperor's Children list that I've been running. This is some of the results that I've been having. I hope you found this video interesting. Make sure to like and subscribe so I can keep you up to date with the changes that I make to the list going forward and some of the results from upcoming tournaments. And uh, yeah, make sure you comment below what you think. Uh, if you're running something similar, I would love to know what you're running and what results you've been achieving with your Chaos Space Marines or similar sort of lists. And if you're not running it, I'd love to know what you think about this list and whether or not you think that your list could actually go to toe-to-toe -to -toe with it and, and how you think you would fare if you came across this on the tabletop, what you think you would do, how you think you would play it. And uh, yeah, until the next time, have a good one. Do your objective markers ever get lost behind terrain or other models and become difficult to see? Do they ever get bumped and accidentally moved during a game? And do they ever spark arguments about distances? Well, not anymore. Introducing the blog for the blood god, not even remotely patented, neoprene objective markers. Made from the same material as astronaut suits, or maybe military equipment, or probably neither of those things, this two millimeter thick neoprene synthetic rubber is tear resistant, water resistant, 
and is designed to last. But that's not all. The blog for the blood god, not even remotely patented, neoprene objective markers come in a variety of different designs and styles to suit any faction represented in the Warhammer 40,000 universe. These objective markers are a perfect gift for yourself or a friend and are a perfect way to flex and show your opponent that not only are you a smarter, cooler and better 40k player than them, but you also have more disposable income than they do. For the low price of $25, you'll get not one, not two, but six neoprene objective markers perfectly designed for 9th edition Warhammer 40k. But wait, there's more. For a limited time only, People who sign up on Patreon to support Blog for the Blood God as a Skull Champion tier $5 per month member will gain access to a custom design service where I will design a unique logo to support their gaming club like the one I did to the left here for the Potato Farmers local gaming club here in Melbourne. Follow the links in the description of this video to pick up your set today.